the fuse, the martial law, uh, all of these techniques. And Reagan gave the opening address to the seminar, the secret, they all wore civilian clothes so, you know, the, the media wouldn't. And he gave the opening address and his words were something to the effect, you know, there are some people in the state who if they could see us all assembled here today would say that their worst fears are being recognized that I'm planning a military takeover. And then this thing, under his encouragement, proceeded to become the California Special Training Institute and continues so that by 1979, UPI reported that it had graduated 14,000 people. And mind you, that's 14,000 generals and admirals and executives. From foreign countries as well as the From United foreign States. countries as well. And this is coordinated, with, as you said, with corporations, with the uh, uh, communications apparatus in the United States. Bell Telephone Company mm -hmm. prominently. And with the police apparatus, the with FBI, the CIA. Police and officers. And local, locals as well. Police officers and sheriffs being brought in from all over the nation mm -hmm. to be briefed on these techniques and associate you know, creating a, a, a police cult, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, so Reagan proceeds to get himself elected president with the help of the people that he was fronting for. But, you know, it's his, right. it's his program, too. It isn't just that they made him. It's what he's been working for, and they've joined with him. And he comes into office promising uh, to effect the Reagan Revolution and to permanently change the society. Now, he has told us many, many times what he would have done if he had been president during the Vietnam War. And he wasn't bluffing. His, uh, his attitude towards dissidents in California during the war, you know, if there has to be a bloodbath, let's get it over with. And he wasn't bluffing. He called out the National Guard and gave them orders to shoot to kill. And then he comes into the, the White House. One element of the revolution is to shatter the government, to gain control of it by breaking it down putting in his own people, very radical people, who would smash it, who would break up the bureaucracy and all the little relationships and everything. You know, James Watt, uh, Ann Burford, for example, Elliot Abrams. Uh, he was put, you remember, uh, in charge of the Human Rights Division of the State Department, sending the files back to the countries in question, and then the Immigration Naturalization Service sending the people back to the countries as well. I mean, this is, these are heavy duty. These people are playing uh, hardball. It's a revolution to them. That's what they call it. Uh, Alfred Regnery, you know, this have you socked your kid today. That was his bumper sticker, put in charge of the Juvenile Division of the Justice Department. Have you socked your kid today? Yeah. The guy, his, his pediatrician went to Washington to testify to the committees saying, you can never put this man in a job where he has to deal with young people. I know because I treat his family. And he was nominated for the juvenile division of the Justice Department. And, you know, you know there hundreds, are, yeah. Uh, there, are, there are parallel things. You look at the National Labor Relations Board stacked against the union. You look at the health organizations where they're going, they're going to have uh, ketchup for uh, mm -hmm. a vegetable. Mm -hmm. Uh, all the way through the government, like you said. Breaking the liberal mindset, uh, you know, of the government. And, and then, throughout, trying to pass laws that would reinforce. I mean, a lot of laws we get are, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers making a law about the environment in some locale, and it's a law. It's enforced by the judges, even though the Congress never voted on it. Agencies applying law, presidential orders setting up laws. Lots of laws he's passed. Uh, but... In addition to that, this 45% of the judges uh, that he's appointed, the federal judges, almost half that he's managed to appoint since he's been in office. Now, this right radical. Right radical. Ain't crazy. People like That's William nuts. Rehnquist, a documented racist and bigot as the, at the top of the Supreme Court. And, and Daniel Mannion, you know, this illiterate attorney, can't write a paper. The son of a John Birch Society founder made a judge. People like that. So that when they get this, when they get the test of the revolution, when they when they pull it together, they will have done all of their homework, all of the spade work, the preparation, uh, will have been done so that they can make it stick. Now, what the Re Reagan revolution has been is to get the pendulum, you know, as it swings over to the right, and then weld it shut, with the laws, with the judges, with the control of the government. Now, the key has been in their planning has been a war. A war, you have a national, you know, security emergency. Uh, you, you can declare martial law. You can take emergency measures in war that you can't uh, argue in peacetime. And this is where they were heading towards the invasion of Nicaragua. 
and it was derailed by the not just the Iran Contra scandal, although that definitely derailed it or postponed it, but also the break apart of the Reagan machine. There was just so much corruption. He had too many incompetent wild men running the thing for him, dealing with people like Oliver North, when he should have had the Carluccis in there to begin with, who, who would do about the same thing, but more credibly, more, more, more soberly, more sane, more, with more credibility in the establishment. He was beginning to come apart last fall before the Iran-Contra thing uh, crashed, uh, brought him down to a point. Now the big question that we, we debate everywhere, I debate it everywhere, I discuss it with the Daniel Ellsbergs and David McMichaels as I travel and lots of other people, is whether or not he will succeed in invading Nicaragua. And that's a horror unto itself. But I have the feeling that people miss the broader implications of this invasion when it happens. Now the Christic Institute, this flawed affidavit, it has a, seg a segment on the Rex 84, the detention centers, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is part of this plan, uh, which is to, to prepare detention centers and laws uh, and an infrastructure across the country so that when they pull off the invasion, they will be able to, to, to sweep 400,000 people off the streets and throw them in detention centers. Now, this one, I asked the, the FEMA people, the, the sober uh, ones there, uh, if they really had this documented. Because we talked about this Rex 84 two or three years ago, and the spotlight had mentioned it, but uh, it, it wasn't really proven. And uh, they assured me, they said, yes, they have this one from top attorneys within FEMA who have admitted to it, and they've got it documented. Plus, they have all the laws from 1950s still on the books, the McCarran Act, which sets up concentration camps, and all the special powers which the president has where he can declare a emergency at any time without getting anybody's approval and putting all these things into effect, taking over the banking system, transportation system, the uh, broadcasting system, and incarcerating everybody. They don't I, like. I think there's another aspect of this desire to invade Nicaragua, and that was the, would be the crowning blow of the Reagan revolution, the fulfillment of it. I think that in this Iran-Contra hearings, we've been seeing all of the anti-communism of these people that were involved in the North Network and in the Reagan foreign policy apparatus, who literally believed in the domino theory that if Nicaragua and El Salvador, quote unquote, weren't communists, then that would be a domino effect going through Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico to the United States, and we would face a communist takeover of this country. He came into office promising, you know, the, the Grenada, Nicaragua, and Cuba. Uh, and he, he did, you know, after the Grenada thing, they had bumper stickers out, Nicaragua next. Mm. Al Haig, now Cuba's a tougher nut. Mm. It's, it's better defended. They can't do it. The cost, I talk to these admirals up in Washington often enough, and they continuously reassure me that our Pentagon, no president here is foolish enough to try to pull off an invasion of Cuba. Not that we couldn't win, but it would be so bloody and so expensive, and there would be uh, so much uh, damage done it would be fought in part in the United States. I mean, we would, you know, we would obliterate Cuba, but the Cubans would take a toll in our own cities here, and no politician could survive that. You know, John, we've been, as part of the Reagan administration, we've been talking about foreign policy. That's our emphasis. Though I think we should briefly also talk about the economic aspects of the Reagan Revolution, which also have been very successful from his point of view. The severe weakening of the labor unions and the working class institutions that have been developed since the 1930s, the lowering of the standard of living of most Americans, a tremendous transfer of wealth and income from the middle and lower classes up to the upper classes. But at the same time, he seriously destabilized the economy of the United States by being such a great adherent of free marketism and deregulation. It has particularly caused chaos in the banking and investment industry where these corporate raiders have come in and seriously destabilized the economy. So although he, it's been a two-edged sword, but nonetheless, he has carried out the Reagan revolution in this aspect too. There's another element where the economics impact on foreign policy and the other issues we've discussed, and that's the military buildup. 
The Reagan administration has spent $2 trillion on weapons since coming into office.